Belfast Blitz was one of the forgotten atrocities of the Second World War. Outside of London, it was the largest single loss of life in any night raid by the Nazis on the British Isles. The attacks consisted of four raids in April and May of 1941. The Luftwaffe had previously made a reconnaissance flight on the 30th of November 1940. The targets in Belfast were obvious and high value. Harland and Wolf shipbuilders and Short Brothers Aircraft Factory were of critical importance to the war effort, while Mackey's engineering supplied weapons and ammunition. Belfast Power Station and Waterworks were vital to the running of these installations. Unfortunately for the people of Belfast, the Nazis planned to carpet bomb the area between York Street and the Antrim Road encompassing these installations, a densely populated part of the city. The Government of Northern Ireland had neither will nor competence to prepare for the threat. Many of the Unionist leaders of the time had little regard for the lower classes, Unionist or Nationalist. They also believed that Belfast was out of the range of the Luftwaffe. Yet the Nazis had already successfully bombed shipyards in the Clyde, in the west of Scotland. After these raids, Security Minister J.C. McDermott wrote to the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, John Andrews, warning that Belfast was certain to be attacked during the next full moon. He was ignored. Lord Haw Haw even promised in a broadcast from Berlin that the Nazis would deliver Easter eggs for Belfast. Such was the complacency that the government only built a limited number of air raid shelters. As a result, Belfast, the city with the highest population density in the United Kingdom, had the lowest number of air raid shelters. The city had no searchlights, no night fighters, and only 22 anti-aircraft guns, 16 of them heavy. The Nazis concluded that Belfast was a soft target, far too inviting to resist. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider subscribing. Thank you. The first raid came overnight on the 7th to 8th of April and was a small one to test the city's defences. The second raid came on Easter Tuesday, 15th of April, 1941. 200 bombers unloaded on Belfast. At least 900 people were killed and 1,500 injured. Almost all were civilians, including children, few of whom had been evacuated. Half the houses in the city were damaged, and 100,000 people were homeless. The third raid came on the 4th to 5th of April, and though less intense, 140 people were killed by an incendiary. The fourth and final raid came the following night, but with much of the city flattened, there was little in the way of targets left. The devastation was shocking. Bombing was indiscriminate. Churches, schools and hospitals were not spared. Burke Street, in the New Lodge area, was wiped off the map. All 20 houses levelled. Most casualties were killed by falling masonry or in the streets as they tried to escape bombed out houses. Morgues were overwhelmed and the city was forced to use public swimming pools temporarily then mass graves. During the worst of the bombing, McDermott asked Andrews for permission to request help from the Irish Free State, as the Republic of Ireland was then known. Thirteen fire engines and 71 firefighters came north from Dundalk, Drogheda, Dublin and Dunleary. In each station, volunteers only were asked for, yet every man volunteered. They stayed for three days until relieved by firefighters from Scotland. By the end of the raids, 200,000 people had fled Belfast, taking refuge with friends or strangers, with nothing other than the clothes they stood in. Lord Haw Haw gloated from Berlin, the Fuhrer will give you time to bury your dead before the next attack. However, Eamon de Valera, the Taoiseach or Prime Minister of the Free State, which was neutral in World War II, protested to Berlin at the tactics and the civilian loss of life. The Nazis, ever paranoid about the US entering the war, 
feared that the Irish community there may bring pressure on the US government to become involved. There were no more raids, and Lord Haw Haw never mentioned Belfast again. So why did this great tragedy fade into history without recognition or commemoration? The answer lay in the terribly divided political situation of Northern Ireland. For some, commemoration of sacrifice or service in world wars is contentious, without similar commemoration of sacrifice in the pursuit of Irish unity. Politics aside, the civilians of Belfast all suffered together, Protestant and Catholic, Unionist and Nationalist, in the face of a barbaric enemy who threatened civilization itself. In 2016, plaques were unveiled at the sites of the greatest loss of life, and in 2019, a narrow vote on Belfast City Council held that a permanent memorial to the thousand and more civilians of all backgrounds who died would finally be erected. Just in time for the 80th anniversary of Belfast's most tragic few nights. Dusan Popov was a Serbian triple agent who worked for the British, the Germans and the exiled King of Serbia during World War II. Codenamed Tricycle by the British and Ivan by the Germans, his true loyalty was to the Allies. His pivotal role in the deception operations prior to the Normandy landings undoubtedly saved thousands of lives. Popov came from a family of wealthy industrialists and lived an international playboy lifestyle. After an undergraduate degree in law, in 1934 he enrolled at Freiburg University in Germany to pursue his doctorate. Here he met and befriended Johann Johnny Jebsen, another son of wealthy industrialists, and the man who would bring him into intelligence work shortly after the outbreak of war. Both men despised the Nazis, and Popov was briefly imprisoned by them in 1937 on suspicion of being a communist. Jebsen's role in securing his release cemented the men's close friendship. Returning to Yugoslavia to practice law, Popov next met Jebsen in 1940 and was surprised to discover that the latter had joined the Abwehr, German military intelligence. Jebsen assured Popov that it was merely for convenience and recommended that Popov should do likewise, since the Abwehr had an interest in recruiting him. Popov acquiesced and immediately offered himself to MI6 as a double agent. It seemed certain that Popov and Jebsen had a clear understanding that any information Jebsen passed to Popov was to be passed on to the Allies. There's lots more to come in this video but please consider subscribing. Thank you. Popov relocated to London, and the two would meet in Lisbon periodically, where Popov and Jebsen would feed MI6 disinformation to their Abwehr handlers. Neutral Portugal was a hotbed of espionage throughout the war. From 1941 to 43, together with Popov's brother Ivo, they ran a double agent recruitment program in Yugoslavia, Popov would refer recruits to Jebsen, who would have them trained in Berlin by the Abwehr. Once in the field, they would work for the Allies. Popov was a crucial part of Operation Fortitude, the Allied disinformation campaign to persuade the Nazis that D-Day would take place at Calais rather than Normandy. Disaster struck when Jebsen was lured to Lisbon and arrested by the Abwehr. The British assumed that Popov and Operation Fortitude had been exposed and shut down all his activities. But intercepted German transmissions suggested that the Abwehr still regarded Popov as an asset and were more interested in financial frauds that Jebsen was involved in. They had no idea that they had been completely penetrated by the British. Jebsen heroically revealed nothing under interrogation even though it may have saved his own life. He knew everything about the Normandy disinformation campaign, but he knew that if he exposed Popov as a double agent, his friend was a dead man walking. 
Operation Fortitude was restarted and was a huge success for the Allies. The unfortunate Jebson was last seen in February 1945, being taken from Sachsenhausen concentration camp by the Gestapo. Popov said nothing of his wartime activities until 1974, having believed that MI6 forbade it. His exploits had already been Ian Fleming's inspiration for James Bond. 007 was the last three numbers of Popov's uncle's phone number in Belgrade. Later declassified documents from British secret archives confirmed that his wartime escapades were every bit as remarkable as the fictional superagent that Popov provided the inspiration for. Edward VIII was crowned King of the United Kingdom on the 20th of January 1936, accompanied by the usual pomp and circumstance. While royalists across the British Empire were filled with hope and a sense of renewal, Edward's reign would end just 326 days later when he chose to abdicate and marry the divorced American socialite Wallace Simpson. That melodrama is a story all on its own, yet historically more interesting is what happened next. A series of events which prompted persistent rumours that Edward was not only a Nazi sympathiser, but was prepared to betray the nation he had once ruled. In the 1930s, approval of Hitler was not uncommon, particularly amongst British elites. The Nazis were seen as a necessary, if crude, bulwark against communism in Soviet Russia. Hitler was also an ardent admirer of the British. Most of those same sympathizers would ultimately be horrified at the colossal crimes that the Nazis would commit, but at the time, few realized the danger. Though princes and monarchs never made public utterances on politics, High society was well aware that in the pre-war period, Edward was a Nazi sympathizer. He also believed in racial superiority. After a 1920 visit to Australia, he wrote of Australian Aboriginals, They are the most revolting form of living creatures I have ever seen, the lowest form of human beings, and the nearest thing to monkeys. After the abdication, his successor and brother, George VI, named him Edward, Duke of Windsor. Edward married Simpson in France on the 3rd of June 1937. All British royalty were barred from attending, and Wallace Simpson was not allowed to be known as the Duchess of Windsor, moves which Edward bitterly resented. He had also believed that after a year or two of exile in France, he and his wife would be permitted to return to England. The new king made clear that this would not happen. Edward was furious, believing that the establishment had betrayed him. In October 1937, as though in an act of revenge, Edward and his wife visited Nazi Germany and were received by Hitler at the Berghof. The British government were mortified, particularly when the Duke gave Nazi salutes. The Nazis, masters of propaganda, received them as genuine royalty on a state visit and scored a major public relations coup. Albert Speer quoted Hitler as saying that if Edward had remained king, then a military alliance between Britain and Germany would have been assured. It was rumoured that Hitler and Edward discussed scenarios under which he could return to the throne. This has never been substantiated. In a May 1939 interview on NBC Radio, Edward appeared to endorse further appeasement just a few months before war was declared. The BBC, likely under pressure from the government, refused to broadcast it, though it was reported in newspapers. As the so-called phony war of 1939 ended and hostilities loomed in early 1940, Edward was appointed a major general 
attached to the British military mission in France. At this point, serious allegations of treachery against the Duke began to emerge. In February 1940, the German ambassador to The Hague, Julius von Sackberger's Rhoda, claimed that Edward had leaked British war plans to Germany. The claim was denied, though the British government took it seriously. As king, before the war, Edward had a cavalier attitude towards secret documents sent to him by the cabinet. Simpson had been reading them, as had other visitors to the royal household, and they were often left unsecured. This was irresponsible, especially since American intelligence sources believed that Simpson was a close friend of the German foreign minister Joachim von Ribbentrop and was even more favourable towards Hitler than the Duke. Consequently, Edward had long been regarded as a security risk by the British, whether unwittingly or wittingly. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider subscribing. Thank you. As France fell, the couple began an odd series of moves that aroused further suspicion. Instead of returning to England, they first went to Biarritz, then fascist Spain, before finally settling in neutral Portugal, at the home of a shady character named Ricardo Espirito Santo, who had inherited a banking fortune and retained contacts with various intelligence agencies, including both the Germans and the British. There followed a bizarre Nazi plan, Operation Willy, to persuade Edward to return to occupied Europe and work with the Nazis on securing an accommodation with Britain. Orders were given to kidnap him if necessary. Winston Churchill became aware of the plot and demanded Edward return to England or face a court-martial. In the event, Churchill solved the situation by appointing the Duke Governor of the Bahamas. The couple left Lisbon on the 1st of August. Though out of the way, Edward continued to make occasional embarrassing statements, either about accommodation with Germany or about the people he governed. Further embarrassment ensued when it emerged that Edward had asked the Nazis to guard his French property during the occupation, a request with which they complied. Following the war, the Duke returned to France and lived the remainder of his life out of the public eye. As declassified documents emerged, mainly after his death, speculation mounted about his political sympathies and potentially treacherous behaviour. So did he betray his country? No paper trail or intercepted broadcast ever implicated him, though such a high-level spy would likely be outside the regular intelligence loop. Some of the statements implicating him may have been an attempt by the Nazis to lower morale in Britain. Yet there is no doubt that he was pro-Nazi before the war, and he expressed, in the presence of others, his admiration for Hitler. The British and American governments were both very suspicious of the Duke and his wife, both before the war and during it. Until solid evidence emerges from archives, like all of us, he remains innocent until proven guilty. But his own pronouncements and behaviour did nothing to allay suspicion and ensures that his reputation will be forever clouded by the allegation that he treacherously assisted one of the most evil regimes of all time. The Second World War is an endless source of fascinating and almost unbelievable true stories. One such tale revolves around two unlikely allies, the Nazis and the IRA, or Irish Republican Army, who have fought campaigns for a united Ireland and an end to British involvement in that troubled part of the world. The story proved the maxim that my enemy's enemy is my friend. Between the wars, the Republic of Ireland, or Irish Free State as it was then known, had gained close to full independence from the British Empire. As hostilities began, the government of Eamon de Valera faced a sobering dilemma. 
by declaring war on the seemingly ascendant Nazis, they would be a prime target for a backdoor invasion of the UK. By remaining neutral, they risked reoccupation by the British. De Valera chose the course of neutrality. This course, when combined with the infamous telegram of condolences on the death of Hitler, would ultimately damage the Free State's reputation, although it seemed the safest option at the time. For the IRA, there was a different calculus. They still regarded the treaty end of the Irish War of Independence, which divided the island into two separate countries and resulted in the Irish Civil War between pro- and anti-treaty forces as a betrayal of nationalist ideals. They had lost the Civil War, and having been banned by the Free State Government in 1935, were effectively on the run. But in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity, and as war approached, a new IRA Army Council, under the leadership of Sean Russell, made a decision to forge links with the Nazis. To that point, the IRA had been unmistakably socialist. IRA men raised a column to fight for the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War, although the organization's rightward move led to a ban on the so-called Connolly Column. With the socialist wing of the IRA either dead or in jail, Russell charted a militarist course, determined to confront Britain in Northern Ireland. Social policy of the organization became more Catholic and corporatist inspired, moving more in the direction of Mussolini than Marx. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider subscribing. Thank you. In January 1939, the IRA Army Council officially declared war on Britain. S-Plan, as it was called, started a campaign of sabotage bombings on the British mainland. On the 23rd of December 1939, IRA members stole almost the entire reserve ammunition store of the Irish Army from the magazine Fort in Dublin. Much of it later turned up in Northern Ireland, discovered by the Royal Ulster Constabulary, presumably stashed in preparation for an attack on the North. These actions impressed the Nazis, and they dispatched an Abwehr agent, Oscar C. Faust, to quote, seek out the IRA leadership make contact, ask if they would be interested in cooperation with Germany, and if so, send a liaison man to Germany. Sean O'Donovan, a German-speaking and high-ranking member of the IRA, was dispatched to Germany. After a series of meetings, logistics for cooperation, such as communication, safe houses, and supply of weapons, were established. From here, though, things began to go pear-shaped. The IRA had too weak a radio transmitter to contact the Nazis reliably. Then disaster struck. Russell travelled to Germany in 1940 to request arms, but on the return journey in a German U-boat, he was taken ill and died. His successor, Stephen Hayes, floated Plan Kathleen an invasion of Northern Ireland to the Nazis only for it to be immediately discovered by Irish intelligence. Gunter Schutz, an Abwehr agent sent to supervise operations, was arrested as soon as he parachuted into Ireland. He eventually escaped, but when a courier was caught with minutes of an army council meeting, Schutz and all proposed operations were completely compromised again. A prized Belfast unit of the IRA the so-called Protestant Squad, were talked into an ill-advised gun battle with the RUC, resulting in the complete capture of the unit, one of whom was executed. All other operations were either stillborn or turned out to be complete fiascos. The whole episode was a disaster for the IRA. Many members were executed. What little public support they had waned further. As the true horror of the Nazis became evident, the organization would be forever stained by the association. Humiliated and bitterly divided, 
the IRA called a ceasefire in its war against Britain on the 10th of March, 1945. So ineffective had their campaign been that the world reacted with bemusement to the end of a war that they didn't even know had existed. First, a brief reference to the history of the Nazi party. As the infamous Hermann Goering awaited his fate at the Nuremberg trial, behind the scenes, another Goering, his younger brother Albert, was fighting for his freedom. The amazing story of Albert Goering would take decades to emerge, and he would die ignominiously before it did. Albert Goering was born on the 9th of March 1895 near Berlin. The fifth child of Heinrich Ernst Goering, the former Reich's Commissar to German Southwest Africa and German Consul General to Haiti. The Goerings were related to aristocracy, including the Zeppelins of airship fame and the Merck family, founders of the pharmaceutical giant that bears their name. The Goering family lived with their children's aristocratic godfather of Jewish heritage, Ritter Hermann von Eppenstein, in his Veldenstein and Mautendorf castles. Von Eppenstein acted as a surrogate father to the children, as their biological father was often away. Like his brother, Albert served in the First World War as a signal engineer in the German army. Following the conflict, Albert became something of a bon vivant, with a dilettante career as a filmmaker. When the Nazis ascended to power, with his brother at the very top of the party, it seemed that Albert was set fair. However, he despised the Nazis, regarding them as brutes. He quietly, and sometimes very publicly, intervened on behalf of people in the crosshairs of Nazi tyranny, Stories abounded of Albert intervening in the street, where lower-level Nazi officers were mistreating citizens, often Jews. The officers in charge were immediately cowed when they discovered who he was. When Albert's former boss, Oskar Pitzer, was arrested by the Nazis, Goering used his influence to have him freed, then further assisted Pitzer and his family in escaping from Germany. At the time of the Anschluss, or Union, between Austria and Germany, Albert was based near Vienna. He set about exhaustively trying to arrange exit visas for as many of his Jewish friends as he could. He also managed to convince his reluctant brother to have Archduke Joseph Ferdinand of Austria, the last remaining Habsburg prince, released from the Dachau concentration camp. After the outbreak of war, Albert was appointed export director of the Skoda Works in occupied Czechoslovakia. In Prague, he was brazenly subversive, forging his brother's signature to have dissidents released, and requesting labour from concentration camps, then releasing them as soon as they arrived. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. Yet no matter what he did, Herman was always loyal to him and constantly used his clout to pull Albert out of the fire. Four times he squashed arrest warrants. In 1944, there was a shoot on sight order from the SS in Prague against Albert. Herman stuck his neck out again but this time informed Albert that this would be the last time. The brotherly love was understandable, but Hermann Goering's actions have also led some to consider reappraising parts of Hermann's reputation. Specifically, could the man who jump-started the Holocaust by sending a memo to Reinhard Heydrich requesting a plan for extermination be less anti-Semitic than previously assumed? Hermann Goering certainly had no problem sparing Jews that his brother asked him to. He often did so merely for financial gain, or to add to his world-renowned art collection. Despite signing the infamous memo, he played no active part in the Holocaust, and may have signed the order, 
simply because Hitler didn't want his name on it. By 1942, following his defeat by the RAF in the Battle of Britain, and his failure to prevent Allied bombing of Germany, he was completely sidelined. He spent the remainder of the war brooding in his castles and villas, Hitler's deputy in name only. At best, Hermann Goering was ambivalent toward the fate of the Jews, with Albert as his occasional conscience. Albert was detained after the end of the war, purely for being Hermann's brother. The two men met for the last time in May 1945, at a transit jail in Augsburg. Hermann apologised to Albert for putting him in a difficult position. The Allies at the Nuremberg Tribunal refused to believe that Albert was part of the resistance to Nazism, until 34 prominent people came forward with their stories of how Albert had saved them. But things would not improve when he gained his freedom. He was shunned in Germany and found it almost impossible to find work. Depression, alcoholism and divorce followed. Living in a small flat on a state pension, his last years were far removed from the splendour of his earlier life. On the 20th of December, 1966, he died penniless and a pariah, without any public recognition of the part he played in saving hundreds of innocent lives. The story of Finland during World War II is an extraordinary one. Initially defending themselves against an attack from the Soviet Union, they then fought on the same side as Nazi Germany, before finally switching allegiance and fighting with the Allies against Hitler. Finland's complex relations were rooted in its history of occupation and domination by other countries. For almost 700 years, Finland was part of Sweden. In the Finnish War of 1809, between Sweden and Russia, Finland entered into an autonomous union with the Russian Empire, and from this time forward, the country prospered. But the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 appeared to threaten Finland's situation. The country's parliament declared independence, a declaration the overstretched Bolsheviks were forced to accept. Parliament ordered Russian troops and local communists to disarm, leading to the Finnish Civil War, which was decided when German troops on the Eastern Front entered Helsinki. A subsequent purge of Red Guards led to the deaths of over 12,000 people. The new government of Prime Minister Juho Kusti Pasikivi pursued a pro-German policy. After the Bolshevik victory in the Russian Civil War, Finland and Russia convened to decide the border between the two countries. The result was uneasy for both sides, and disputes remained, most notably concerning Russian Karelia, which had a Finnish-speaking majority, despite never being part of Finland. Fast-forwarding 20 years to the signing of the infamous Molotov-Ribbentrop non-aggression pact between Hitler and Stalin, Finland was part of the secret carve-up of Europe that the two tyrants envisaged. Following its completion, the Soviets made territorial demands of Finland that the latter had no intention of accommodating. On the 26th of November, the Red Army carried out a false flag operation, claiming that the Finns had shelled a Russian village, which they had shelled themselves. On the 30th of November, the Soviet Union invaded a move that resulted in their expulsion from the League of Nations. The so-called Winter War had begun. The nine divisions of the Finnish army faced 16 divisions of the Red Army, with the Soviets also enjoying total armour and air superiority. Finland also had to contend with defending a 1,287-kilometre frontier. In the initial stages, the Soviets advanced, and attempted a pincer movement to encircle the defenders. But by late December, they had been stopped in their tracks by the performance of a Finnish army, which exceeded all expectations. A renewed Soviet offensive in 1940 
forced the Finns to the peace treaty table, and they were eventually obliged to accept territorial concessions that exceeded those originally demanded. A lull had been secured, but Finland was under no illusions that the Soviets would be back for more. The Finns made frantic attempts at a diplomatic and military understanding with both Britain and Sweden, to no avail. The only possible arrangement left was with the Nazis. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel, and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. Finland's situation was a gift to Hitler, having never had any intention of upholding the non-aggression pact with Stalin. By the summer of 1941, Operation Barbarossa, the plan to steamroll the Soviet Union, was ready to roll. He was happy to have the Finns on board. As Barbarossa began, the Soviets retaliated with air raids on Finnish cities. Finland declared war and allowed German troops stationed in Finland to attack the Soviet Union. So began what is known in Finland as the Continuation War. Finnish troops quickly regained the territory previously lost, and then some, participating in the blockading of Leningrad, though failing to take the vital port of Murmansk. Now all of a sudden, on the 4th of August 1941, the Soviets wanted peace with Finland. But the Finns weren't falling for that one. By December, Great Britain had declared war on Finland, though this was largely symbolic. At this point, Finland's armies dug into defensive positions. For almost three years, the Finnish front line was relatively quiet. Then on the 9th of June 1944, the Red Army launched a major offensive that pushed the Finns back to pre-continuation war positions. Eventually, the Soviet offensive was fought to a standstill in the Battle of Tali Ihantala. But as in the Winter War, prospects for defending a second offensive were bleak. Finnish President Rusto Riti gave Germany his personal guarantee that Finland would not negotiate peace with the Soviet Union for as long as he was president. In exchange, Germany delivered weapons to the Finns. After the Soviet offensive was halted, however, Riti resigned. With elections impossible due to the war, the Parliament selected the Marshal of Finland, Carl Gustav Emil Mannheim, the Finnish Commander-in-Chief, as President, and charged him with negotiating a peace. The Soviets were preoccupied with the race to Berlin, and had received a few bloody noses from the Finnish army, so quickly signed a ceasefire in September 1944, moving vital troops from the Finnish frontier to charge towards the German capital. They did, however, insist that Finland pressure remaining German troops to leave Finnish territory. Some remained in Lapland, refusing to withdraw to Norway, resulting in the short Lapland War. German troops were forced out and instituted a scorched-earth policy as they left. At the end of the war, Finland was designated as an ally of Nazi Germany and punished with reparations and territorial loss with the final peace treaty signed in Paris in February 1947. Throughout the Cold War, they were neutral and received assurances from the Soviet Union that their territory and neutrality would not be breached. Finland siding with Nazis for parts of World War II should not be seen too harshly. They were abandoned by European democracies and forced into one tyrant's arms by the threat of another. Their army was outside the German command structure. They fought only against the Red Army, and latterly, against the Nazis. Finnish Jews were not persecuted or deported, although in 2000, the Finnish government apologised for an incident where eight of the 500 Jewish refugees in Finland were handed over to the Germans. Inside Finland, the continuation war is hotly debated but many realised that it was a war of self-preservation, an alliance of convenience as a last resort, and that they made the best that they could of a deal with the devil.